For regular videos on ancient cultures and forgotten civilizations, please subscribe. If you are fascinated by ancient Egypt and make an effort to soak up whatever information you can about it, then here on YouTube and around the internet, you might have come across the term chematology. Chematology is offered up as an alternative to Egyptology, and its proponents present it as a more authentic, reliable, and ultimately superior approach to the great past of the land of the Nile. The originator of the term, Stephen Mailer, was the first to systematically propound this form of study. Although he himself is an American with no Egyptian ancestry, he asserts that chematology is based on the indigenous wisdom of the ancients. Do we have reason to trust these claims? We're going to find out right now. Stephen Mailer is an independent researcher who first came to prominence for trying to prove the authenticity of the crystal skulls. In the 1990s and early 2000s, he turned his attention more closely to Egypt. And in 2001, he published the book, The Land of Osiris, An Introduction to Chematology, which I have read and I will refer to many times in this video. Although Mailer seems to have stepped out of the limelight recently, chematology lives on in the Kemet School of Ancient Mysticism, run by Patricia Awian Lehman and her husband Yusef Awian. This mystical school offers tours in Egypt and has a shop near the Giza necropolis. The tour guides of the Kemet School teach Egyptian history from the Kemetological point of view rather than according to academic scholarship. Patricia Awian, also an American, who has formulated the Kemet School's philosophy as presented on its website, clearly bases it on the ideas propounded by Mailer. We're going to take a look at the basic premise of chematology as taught by Mailer. He does not have an active YouTube channel, but I did find a video of him presenting his ideas, which I will play parts of for you. This was a presentation he gave shortly after the release of his next book, From Light into Darkness, in 2005, which delves even more into the mystical aspects of chematology. And how I came to this was through my long research into the field of academic Egyptology and realizing that it didn't sit the bill, the answers weren't, the questions weren't answered by academic Egyptologists, I went into the metaphysical aspect of it. I got involved with the Rosicrucian Order, AMARC, in San Jose, California, where I was a staff research scientist for two years and got into the metaphysical esoteric traditions, but even that didn't fulfill the bill. You may wonder why he's talking about metaphysical esoteric traditions. This is one of the fundamental parts of his philosophy. In his book, he writes, I realized that to understand what the civilization of ancient Egypt was truly about meant integrating science and mysticism. And this remains my approach today. I think it's important to stop here and note that the mystical aspects of chematology are drawn not entirely or even primarily from Egyptian traditions, but from the esoteric traditions Mailer has picked up in various places in his life. Rosicrucianism is a European esoteric tradition based largely on medieval texts. By the way, you cannot integrate science and mysticism because they have two fundamentally opposing principles by which to obtain knowledge. It's not a both-and situation. It's either-or. It actually was in about early 1990 that I discovered a, a book by Murray Hope, which David sells in his bookstore, called Ancient Egypt, A Serious Connection, where she discussed the fact that there may be a living tradition in Egypt today that has a different background of what Egypt was about, and we call it the indigenous tradition. Here is a fuller account of this series of events given in his book. During the 1990s, Bob Vauder, his collaborator at the time, and I delved deeper into the works of Schwaller, that's R.A. Schwaller de Lubitz, the author of The Temple of Man, which popularized the mystical idea of sacred geometry, Hall, Manley Hall, a Rosicrucian mystic, Edgar Cayce, an American clairvoyant, West, that's John Anthony West, who claimed the Sphinx was thousands of years older than the time of the dynastic Egyptians, and Blavatsky, Madame Blavatsky, the Russian-American spiritualist. We became convinced through these works, and especially with G.R.S. Mead's theosophical book, Thrice Great Hermes, 
that there had indeed been an inner group of adepts, masters and initiates, who had directed the course of ancient Egypt and had inherited their wisdom and knowledge from an even more ancient civilization. We also entertain the hope that remnants of this tradition might still exist in Egypt, and it became our fervent desire to connect with members of this tradition. The events that enabled this connection to be made were significant. I discovered the works of occult author Murray Hope, a Wiccan priestess and student of the classical mystical tradition, who wrote the book Ancient Egypt, The Serious Connection, in 1990. In this book, she mentions that she had connected with a group in Egypt that still held to an ancient tradition. She called this group the Ammonite Foundation and declared that they had never been converted to Islam or Coptic Christianity and held traditions that could be traced back at least 3,000 years. This was the first indication to me that this tradition still existed in present-day Egypt. So Mailer had read a lot of books by mystics none of whom were Egyptian, West being the only one not a mystic, who made all kinds of extravagant claims about Egypt. And as he says, he hoped fervently to find a secret group of adepts in Egypt that inherited mystical knowledge from a civilization more ancient than Egypt and who had directed the course of Egyptian history. And that book set me on the mark. In 1992, I went to Egypt for the first time. And I met the man who is my teacher, and his name is Abdel Hakim Awiyan. Everybody knows him as Hakim. He's a well-known tour guide. He is retired now, but he has over 50 years experience in the field as a tour guide. Most people who have been to Egypt say, oh, I know Hakim. He's a great tour guide. Well, in the early 1990s, he also revealed himself as an indigenous wisdom keeper, part of an oral tradition. How long did it take Mailer to find one of these adepts? Mailer says in his book, The Land of Osiris, that he found Hakim Awiyan on his very first day there. He went on a tour with Power Place Tours, and Hakim was the tour guide. What are the chances? Maybe you are aware of this, but Egyptian tour guides are not the most reliable when it comes to information they present on tours. Some, of course, are better trained and more responsible than others. But one can't always accept uncritically what they tell you because they want to entertain and impress their clients. If that means embellishing a bit, so be it. They give the people what they want. And tours are often tailored to the interests of their clients. Mailer was on a tour appealing already to his interests. By this, I do not mean to say that I think Hakim Awiyan was deceptive. I am sure he had a lot of knowledge. But I do think he would have been as agreeable and accommodating to Mr. Mailer's wants as possible. In his book, Mailer says he asked Hakim if he was one of the Ammonites. And he claims Hakim affirmed this, but said that Hakim preferred not to go by that name. I wish I could have heard the exchange, because I have my doubts about that. There are no other witnesses to this conversation. As for Mailer's claim that Hakim Awiyan said he was an indigenous wisdom keeper, that I find much more believable, because we have many witnesses to that claim, including from members of the family. Of course, when I hear the phrase wisdom keeper, I think of the kind of wisdom that pertains to morals, spirituality, and practical guidance for life, wise sayings passed down from sage people. But Mailer says it was more than that, as we will go on to see. He claims the wisdom passed to Hakim includes historical information. Some might assume that I have a bias against oral tradition as a form of historical testimony. I want to assure such people that I believe that oral tradition has a place in the historical process. There are, in fact, historians that deal exclusively with oral traditions. Yeah, it's a subfield of history. Oral sources are irreplaceable because they contain information that would otherwise be lost. They are sources that come from the inside, so to speak, because they provide intimate accounts from the descendants of the people who experienced them. There are certain parts of the world where all we have is oral tradition about the past. Such traditions are invaluable. So oral tradition has a vital role to play in history. Now, people who know Native American traditions, who studied the Native American tradition, know that the oral tradition, and in part in Asia, is very much a part of these cultures. Well, it's also as part of Africa, but no one has ever considered, certainly not Egyptologists, that there is an oral tradition 
And Hakim represents that. Mailer says that no one has ever considered that there is an oral tradition in Egypt. And so I dug into the matter to see if this is true. What I found is that, yes indeed, historians have not only considered an Egyptian oral tradition, but they have studied it, as well as the oral traditions of many countries in Africa. The art of the Egyptian oral story does draw upon older and more complex traditions, and the origins of some of them date back, at, at least in part, to the indigenous traditions that preceded the Arab conquest and the establishment of Islam there. They are often ritualistic and of a simple nature, comprising gestures, songs, cries, and dances, still somewhat pagan in form. This is first and foremost a folk art, a traditional art of the people, which comes out at social gatherings and is the privilege of the elders of the community. The sources from which the tales and legends come are diverse. Some are universal stories you will find in many countries. Arabic storytellers have their own versions of Cinderella and Snow White, for example. Others are of local origin. Examples would be legends of mummies bringing vengeance on the desecrators of tombs, or the beautiful woman of the Nile, who appears at the full moon to pass on messages. Some legends are legacies of the period immediately before Islam arrived, like the story of Kariba, who is said to have lived thousands of years ago and was the mother of all African Jews. The story, however, can't be traced further back than a few hundred years. That's the thing. Just because an oral story is said to be set thousands of years ago, that doesn't mean the story is true or that it is thousands of years old. One of the phenomena that historians of oral tradition have been noting is the gradual loss of the art. Sadly, the storytellers of today no longer seem to be able to render from memory complete versions of some of the longer epic chronicles, as they had in times past. This is a sign that this art is on the path to extinction. A lot of this has to do with trends in the development of society and more modern methods of communication. Besides folk tales and legends, another popular genre of Egyptian oral tradition is folk wisdom, which plays primarily a moral role. Proverbs are very common, and they usually are firmly rooted in the Arab Muslim tradition, but there are no doubt some that have survived from earlier times. Hakim, even according to Mailer, seems to have been far more interested in the wisdom aspect of oral tradition rather than the historical aspect. But Mailer, as we shall see, is going to use Hakim to bolster a historical narrative largely based on the work of others and of himself rather than Hakim. He writes, quote, Hakim often spoke to me of the indigenous tradition he adheres to in the last few years of the 1990s, stating that he was chosen as a young boy by female elders of his tribe to be a future wisdom keeper. The indigenous tradition that Hakim represents is one of long-standing oral teaching and initiation that goes back thousands of years before the advent of writing. This tradition is similar to that of the African griots, those who have maintained a detailed record of tribal history strictly by oral transmission for many generations." Unquote. The tradition of the griots can be traced back several centuries, but certainly not thousands of years before the advent of writing. So one has to wonder why the folk tradition of which Hakim was a part would be so much older than any of the other oral traditions found in Africa. Is Mailer's claim about the age of this tradition justified? But he goes even farther. His tribe, the Awiani tribe, which is called the Ai tribe, everybody's wearing an eye of horse, an eye of Ra, represents this tribe. They not only kept the history of their own tribe, they kept the history of all tribes. So now we're told that not only is the oral tradition that Hakim took part in much older than all other oral traditions, but also that it included the history of all the tribes. And when Mailer says all the tribes, as we will see, he means all the tribes of the whole world. So as you can see, this is a very extravagant claim. So what we present to you is over 65,000 years of oral tradition. Just saying that the oral tradition is thousands of years old would be quite an assertion. But he is giving it a firm age of 65,000 years. Let's think about that for a minute. How does oral tradition work? An observer of an event or series of events reports their experience orally to someone else, casting it into an initial message. This is the beginning. The second party hears it and passes it on. Once it passes a generation, it has become an oral tradition. From party to party, it is passed on until finally it reaches someone who records it. 
In this case, that would be Stephen Mailer. A chain of transmission exists in which each party is a link. Each party is the creator of a historical document, an oral one. Now, a historian rightly considers each link as evidence, though the only one they have access to is the final one. This evidence may be second, third, or nth remove, but it still is evidence, as long as it is somehow linked to the original message. And that is the most important point. There can be no break in the chain anywhere along the way. But how can we know? We can't, really. There's no way to verify that. However, a tradition passed through multiple channels of communication is better than one passed through a single channel of communication because the information will have greater built-in redundancy. Because Hakim is the only known source for the tradition Mailer is relating, we do not know if anyone else has inherited this information. What we have here is allegedly a 65,000-year-old oral tradition, assuming 25 years per generation, that would be 2,600 generations, with one man as the only known receiver of this information. In his book, Mailer writes the following, quote, To this day, Hakim will point to some of the guardians, those who maintain the ancient sites, and call them keepers, to let us know these people are part of the tradition, unquote. Mailer interpreted Hakim's use of the word keepers, not as keepers of the ancient sites, but as keepers of the indigenous wisdom tradition. But I have to wonder why he never went to such ones to verify what Hakim was saying, or to compare what he had heard with what they had heard. Time does not exist in oral tradition. If the story started out, ten years ago such and such happened, how is the next person in the chain, a generation later, going to communicate that? Is he going to add another few years to the number? Is each person in the chain expected to keep revising the math? No, and for this reason, stories in oral tradition don't provide a chronology. There is no way a historian of oral tradition can date a story in any direct way. They can establish a sequence of events from oral tradition, since oral tradition does use words like before and after. For example, an event might be dated before or after a calamity of some kind. And that might be at play here. An oral tradition might contain a genealogy, and a historian could work out a chronology from it. As far as I know, Hakim did not have a genealogy as part of his tradition. It would be hard to remember the names of 2,600 generations of ancestors. So the question comes up, how did Hakim know his stories go back 65,000 years? Or maybe I should ask, how does Mailer know Hakim's stories go back 65,000 years? There's really no way to tell. But if it did, it would be the longest oral tradition I've ever heard of. Even claims about the antiquity of the oral tradition of the Aboriginal people of Australia don't go nearly that far back. While oral tradition is valuable, its limitations need to be fully appreciated. There are no independent sources to cross-check. The structuring of the stories and chronology complicate matters. That is why reconstructions of history based on oral tradition tend to be less detailed than people would like. It has a lesser order of reliability and takes longer to achieve results. Written sources survive unaltered through time. If someone finds an inscription, it is direct testimony from the time it was written. Copies of written sources naturally are a testimony of the time the copy was made. But in all cases, the interpretation of a story ends when it is written down. It doesn't change after that unless someone copies it again. Writing makes utterances permanent. Oral sources, on the other hand, get interpreted each time it passes through another person. And since it must pass through people in order to survive, there is a new version of it each time. Oral sources accumulate interpretations through transmission. They don't just sit in the ground somewhere on a tablet for someone to dig up. Because interpretation happens with each telling, oral historians consider each telling not as a raw source, but as a hypothesis. Hypotheses aren't accepted as true uncritically. They have to be tested. The stories are given the attention they deserve and are systematically tested and evaluated on their merits. Mailer doesn't do this. He assumes the oral tradition to be true and then finds evidence to justify it, discarding or ignoring any evidence that contradicts it. 
or he will hand wave the oral tradition if it doesn't appeal to him. In order to conduct proper research of oral tradition, historians need to stay in an area for a long time and conduct many series of interviews, recording all the information that they can, so that they may compare and contrast all their sources. While conducting this research, they also need to be familiar with the techniques and critical requirements of history so that they can ask the right questions. All those who are working on related traditions need to share their research so that everyone can benefit from it and incorporate it into their research. Mailer has never done any of this. And stating that there was a previous civilization before what is known as dynastic Egypt, before what is known as Egypt to Egyptologists that existed and was very highly advanced, built the pyramids, carved the Sphinx. So here's the main claim Mailer makes. The oral tradition that Hakim related to him states that there was a highly advanced civilization before dynastic Egypt, and it was the one that built the pyramids and carved the Sphinx. It should be noted that Mailer believed this well before he ever met Hakim. So either he was really lucky to have met him on his first day in Egypt, and Hakim validated Mailer's preconceptions, or Mr. Mailer is using Hakim to validate his preconceptions. And if he has to fudge a little, so be it. As can be observed in the extant recordings of Hakim, he was very familiar with what was written in the alternative archaeology and lost high technology literature. And he incorporated this material into his teachings while on tour, especially after he teamed up with Mailer. Such ideas continued to be propounded by the Kemet school, but now that this mixing of material from various sources has occurred, and Hakim has died, it is no longer possible for us to distinguish which of these teachings originate with the oral tradition and which originate with books Hakim had read, or the things he was told by Mailer and other lost ancient high technology proponents, which undoubtedly appealed to him, and which brought in business for him, and continues to bring in business for the Kemet school. But if we're going to reestablish this idea, we're going to create a whole new discipline. A whole new discipline. He means chemetology. The we apparently refers to him and Hakim, but from what I've been able to find, Mailer's contribution to chemetology is a lot larger than Hakim's. Hakim's contribution is, in fact, quite small. As Mailer writes in his book, quote, Three main parameters emerged for the foundation of my new approach to Egyptology. The work and claims of Dr. J. O. Kinnaman, the teachings of Abdel Hakim Awian, and the theories of Christopher Dunn. Unquote. Mailer says Kinnaman propounded the idea that the Egyptians had anti gravity technology. Christopher Dunn, as you may know already, is the fellow who came up with the hypothesis that the Great Pyramid was a power plant, and he promotes generally the idea of ancient high technology in Egypt. And then we have Hakim, but Mailer ought to have included here his own original ideas, which play a major role in chemetology too. But let's hear his story of how he came up with the name. We have to start with the name itself, Egypt. Egypt is the name of the country in North, Af northeastern Africa today. That was not the name of the ancient civilization. The ancients called their civilization Kemet. And actually, that's a later derivation. The real term was Kem. The Egyptians did indeed refer to their country as something like Kemet, which means black land probably referring to the dark, fertile soil near the Nile. Scholars think maybe the original pronunciation of the word was Kumat. If you're wondering why he spells Kemet as he does, when the spelling K-E-M-E-T is more widely accepted, it's because he needed to differentiate his philosophy from Kemetism, which is a revival movement of Egyptian religion. So now whenever you see the spelling K-H-E-M-I-T, you know you are dealing with the philosophy developed by Mailer. Kemet. And actually, that's a later derivation. The real term was Kem. And it's even in existence today because the Egyptians, one of their terms, the Arabic term for Egypt is Alchem. And is that name sound familiar? Alchemy. That's where alchemy comes from. It's, from the, it's the arts and sciences of ancient Kemet. The word Kem means black in ancient Egyptian. It wasn't used by itself to refer to the land. But in later Egyptian, we do find the word kemi as referring to Egypt, and that word went into the Greek language too as chemia. The word alchemy derives from Arabic alchemia, the Egypt. In other words, the Egypt science. 
but you should know that the beginnings of alchemy in Egypt can be traced back to the Hellenistic period in Egypt and no farther. It combined Egyptian goldsmithing with Greek philosophy and other religious traditions. It is not as ancient as Mailer is making it out to be. Five is a number that the commissions use over and over, along with the number 42. Uh, he uses the term commissions instead of the word Egyptians. 42, why? They tell us 42 was the original number of tribes that made up ancient Kemet. Hakim's prejudice, his bias, as an Afrocentrist, is that we all came from Africa, that it all came from Africa. Africa was the beginning of humanity and the civilization. So the 42 tribes we're talking about that made up ancient Kemet were all races, all types of people, including the Caucasian race. We're taught that we Caucasians came from the Caucasus Mountains in, in the steppes of Russia. Well, according to this tradition, the white race came from Africa, too. So we all came from Africa. It sounds like Mailer is not fully accepting Hakim's claim about this, calling it prejudiced or biased, which is interesting because it indicates that he might be picking and choosing which of Hakim's claims he wants to believe or to include in chemitology. Now, of course, this idea that all the races originated in Africa and emerged fully formed from there is at odds with the findings of genetic science. So clearly the idea cannot be accepted. This is an indication that this received wisdom from the past is fallible. So this ancient civilization, which was known as the Sesh, S-E-S-H, the word for the people, it was 42 tribes. And, and if I had time to show you all this, this continues all through Egyptian iconography. You see, 42 assessors of Osiris. There were 42 steps that every led to every temple. There's 42 this, 42 that. That number comes up and up. For a long time in Egypt, there were 42 gnomes or provinces. And I think this is probably where the tradition of the number 42 comes from. And so does the number five. So five purs. And pur again meant house. The first one is key, per ah, which means the high house. And here's a teaching to blow everything away you've ever learned about Egypt. The word pharaoh, pharaoh. Every day you can go on and see Zahiwas or somebody on National Geographic or talking about the pharaohs, the land of the pharaohs, the pharaoh Ramses, the pharaohs Tutmos. Everybody using the word wrong, including myself for many years, using the word wrong. Per-ah is where the word pharaoh comes from. In Hebrew, it's per o. Of course, the Greeks and the, and the Jews later, patriarchal society, looked at the society of ancient Egypt and they saw kings and sons. So they said, oh, per-ah must be the king's house. Well, it's not. The high house is the woman's house. You're talking about a civilization that was a matriarchy, where descent was matrilineal. Descent went from mother to daughter. Now, this is an interesting claim. Apparently, Hakim told Mailer that Egyptian civilization was matriarchal, not patriarchal. We are not given his exact words, nor the context of these statements. In his book, The Land of Osiris, Mailer says that he already believed Egyptian civilization was matriarchal before he ever met Hakim. So it's interesting that once again, he finds validation. Mailer says also that the Egyptians never revealed to the Greeks or anyone else that their culture was truly matriarchal. They kept it a secret. But let's think on this. Can the hierarchical order of a civilization truly be kept secret? The Greeks lived there. They could be found in cities all through the country. A matriarchy or patriarchy would permeate society. We would see it everywhere, from the legal rights of men and women, to the arrangement of households, to social customs, to economics, to religion. I mean, it could not be hidden. It's impossible to hide. Mailer makes a lot of the fact that landed property in Egypt descended through the female line, and that is true, but that is not the only evidence we should be looking at. Historians of Egypt, specializing in the roles of men and women, have combed through all the available ancient records, poring over them and piecing together information about Egyptian society. And the obvious conclusion is that women in Egypt, although certainly having greater freedoms and rights in their country than, say, Greek women did, did not have equality with men, much less a higher status in society. I will leave some references below the video. So I say to you unequivocally, there never was a male pharaoh, ever, ever. The woman was the per'ah, who she chose to be her consort, could have the right to be king, but it was her house. 
The men in Egypt were only residents in their consort's house. Think about that, folks. Think about that, men. Then why is it that kings took on consorts after they were crowned and had already moved into the palace, and their consorts came to live there after the marriage? This is all documented in Egyptian writings. Mailer thinks the king was just a figurehead, and yet the pyramid texts from as early as the 5th dynasty, which refer to the king as a god, are quite clear about his status as ruler of the people. So are many other documents. Even Hatshepsut, a woman who ruled Egypt, felt the need to wear the clothing of a man, donning a false beard and using masculine pronouns to be accepted by the people. Per netter. And netter is a key word here. That's your pyramid. The house of the netter. What does netter mean? Well, good old Champollion, Frenchman who worked 28, 21 years to decipher hieroglyphics from 1799 to 1821, 22 years actually, thought he was able to translate the symbols of, of Egyptian, what we call hieroglyphs, which is a Greek word. And that's led to the whole field of Egyptology. Well, the fact of the matter is the Greeks couldn't read the symbols correctly. And I, I can go into a lot of detail, but that we, would, we don't have time. So all of Champollion's, Champollion's translations are basically incorrect. All of Egyptology's translations are basically incorrect. Mailer plays free and loose with the Egyptian language. It is his contention that Egyptian hieroglyphs have two meanings. The literal meaning, which Egyptologists are able to read, but also a hidden symbolic reading, which only Hakim and the wisdom keepers of his line are able to understand. In his book, he writes, Quote, the translation of Egyptian inscriptions and texts, forming the major paradigms of Egyptology, was accomplished by Westerners, the French and the British, from a Western source, the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphic writing. Since the Greeks were interlopers, this means the current field of Egyptology is based on the perspective of people who were not part of the indigenous culture, who may have been in fact viewed with hostility by the indigenous wisdom keepers of that culture. This also could mean that the translations of the symbols given to the Greeks by Egyptian priests may have been incomplete in meaning. Abdel Hakim has often suggested that this is exactly the case. Unquote. So the argument, if I'm understanding it correctly, is that because the Egyptians probably hated the Greeks, they wouldn't have allowed them to know the full meaning of the hieroglyphs. Somehow alchemy was taught to the Greeks, so that's strange. Quote, it may be that only those indigenous wisdom keepers like Hakim, representing an oral transmission and initiation into a profound understanding of the symbols, are able to fully translate those symbols for all the rest of us. Unquote. Doesn't this strike you as very convenient? Maybe I'm being cynical. But this allows someone to inject whatever meaning they want into the hieroglyphs and just say, oh, well, this comes from the indigenous tradition. Hieroglyphic experts wouldn't know anything about it. I'm the receiver of special wisdom. And what can you say to that? You can't disprove it. It's an unfalsifiable claim. So the word netter, they translate as god or goddess. Somebody asked earlier, what about all the gods and goddesses of Egypt? Well, the mere fact is we're looking at two different levels of understanding, which I'm going to discuss in great detail in this second book, that there was an exoteric teaching and an esoteric teaching. The exoteric maybe is talking about gods and goddesses, but the true meaning of netter is not God or goddess. And first one, again, who did this in modern times was R. A. Schwala de Lubitsch, who was the first one to look at this word and said, wait a minute, this word doesn't mean deity like we understand. It means an aspect or principle of the divine, part of the whole, not the whole. So netter is actually where the Greek word nature comes from. Netter, nature. So the house of nature, the house of energy. It's interesting how Mailer appeals to the work of the French mystic Schwala de Lubitsch on this point, instead of any Egyptian source. He says in his book that only indigenous wisdom keepers can understand the hieroglyphs, but many of Mailer's interpretations of the hieroglyphs are based on the works of European theosophists, clairvoyants, and mystics. Why are the indigenous wisdom keepers, whom Mailer characterizes as haters of foreign rulers who would never have given secrets away to the Greeks, perfectly okay now with revealing these secrets to Europeans and Americans before even revealing it to Egypt at large. Let's walk through his reasoning. Because Schwaller wrote that netter means an aspect or principle of the divine, he can interpret the word to mean energy. Are divine principle and energy synonyms? Are nature and energy synonyms? That's quite a leap. 
But you see, if he can call a pyramid a house of energy, it will line up with Christopher Dunn's power plant hypothesis, and that's what he wants. Pyramid, Greek word pyramidos, fire in the middle, much closer to the true understanding, had nothing to do with tomb. So of course, at this point, we always stop and say, in its original inception, in its original creation, no one was to be ever buried in a pyramid. Perka is your tomb. This is not tombs. So this throws out 90% of Egyptology right here. They're talking about pyramids and kings being buried in, in pyramids. Nonsense. If he thinks that the idea of the pyramids as tombs makes up 90% of Egyptology, he doesn't know very much Egyptology, but it sounds like he doesn't want to. Mailer claims in his book that when the Egyptians told Herodotus that the pyramids were tombs, they were lying to him. Mailer is very good at hand-waving away evidence that contradicts his views. If you want to see the evidence for the pyramids being tombs, see my video, The True Purpose of the Pyramids. Then let me know what you think. As regard the meaning of the Greek word pyramis, no one is certain what it means. But it does not mean fire in the middle. This folk etymology is cute, but silly. He just took the beginning of the word, pyr, and noticed it looked like the Greek word for fire and then took the second part of the word amid, which is an English word for in the middle, and he got fire in the middle. Part Greek, part English. There is no Greek word amid or amis that means in the middle. Amis means chamber pot in Greek. There are many more claims that Mailer makes, but most of it concerns the arguments of others like Christopher Dunn and other ancient high technology people. There's hardly anything from Hakim in his book. Just tidbits here and there. Anyway, in this video, I just wanted to look at the foundations of his philosophy, where chemitology comes from. Most of chemitology, what Mailer presents as indigenous knowledge, is based on the work of Westerners. And the material that does come from Egyptians is filtered through the lens of Westerners, Mailer himself being one of them. The fact is, chemitology isn't old. It's new. It appeared on the world scene only in the last 30 years. It is hard for me to imagine that a tribe that supposedly kept secret and important information for thousands of years never shared their knowledge with any outsider or even anyone in Egypt before this. It wasn't released to the world until Stephen Mailer came along. What made him so special that he could just ask for it when he went on tour once in Egypt and all would be given him? None of the Greek monarchs, none of the Roman emperors, none of the caliphs throughout the centuries were able to obtain this special knowledge, but this American did. And how did Hakim's tribe obtain knowledge of every tribe in the world? And do we even know who Hakim's immediate predecessor in the chain of communication was? Do we have a name? Who else can verify this information? Why have no other wisdom keepers come forward? Why does Hakim's son, Yusef, not claimed to be the next wisdom keeper in the line. Did the tradition die with Hakim? Are the little snippets we get from Mailer, Patricia Awian, and Yusef all there is that's left of it? The whole thing strains credulity, doesn't it? But one thing it does do is add weight to the claims that Mailer and others like him want to make in people's minds. Instead of having to rely solely on evidence and good argumentation, they have the indigenous wisdom card to play. In many ways, that can end all objection. You can't, after all, prove it's wrong. And this is why I haven't been able to do a lot of fact-checking in this video. I'm not privy to the personal conversations that Hakim had with Mailer. I can't demonstrate if Mailer is reproducing the stories accurately, or even determine how old the stories are. But remember, for science to work, propositions need to be testable. If they can't, as in this case, then they can be believed only on faith. How can they expect a history of Egypt to be written and taught in schools on the basis of faith? It's interesting that on the Kemet School's website, the claims about Hakim being the inheritor of historical information are toned down. The emphasis is on the wisdom and spirituality part. Maybe they too think Mailer has gone too far. Whatever the case, I think you can at least see now that Kemetology is largely the creation of non-Egyptians. Mailer admits as much himself. It seems to me that all that Mailer did here was take his own historical hypothesis, add ancient high technology arguments from others, and dress it up with the trappings of a presumed indigenous tradition. 
My opinion is that he used Hakim as a prop, but you can judge for yourself. I hope this information proved valuable to you. Thank you for watching all the way to the end. If you have any information about chematology that you think would be helpful to add, please do so in the comments below. The Save Ancient Studies Alliance's virtual Opening the Ancient World Conference is returning for its second year running this August. Our theme this year is Who Has the Power? Leaders and Leadership in the Ancient World. Visitors will hear from lots of researchers who have taken an unorthodox approach to studying ancient history outside of or adjacent to academia, and we are putting on presentations about cultures spanning all of the ancient world, such as the Persians, the ancient Chinese, the Egyptians, the Greeks, the Vikings, and the Mesoamericans. The Save Ancient Studies Alliance 2021 Virtual Conference was intellectually exhilarating based on the diverse perspectives and the papers presented, but it was a great help to me in getting comments and questions based on my paper, which I would eventually publish. The conference will be live streamed on Sunday the 14th to Monday the 15th of August 2022 on the SASA YouTube and Facebook channels and via the pages of our partners. Head to our website to RSVP now. You might like my little e-booklet, Why Ancient History Matters. It's designed to persuade people that the subject is important, even in the modern world. You might also wish to use it to help spread the word. So feel free to share it with someone you know. It's free for anyone who wants it. I've left the link in the description box below the video for you to grab a copy. Catch you later.